they had broadband before they impl implemented this this new boneheaded policy and now they're having the problems so it's a temporal pro um, thing anyway right. we can talk about that later yeah we certainly can uh, that's uh, part of the agenda um i'm looking at who's uh lined up here okay so we get coming on to 10 59 i think ellie anytime you want to you want to yeah. watch it's oh, yeah, as, soon as, as soon as it's 11. Okay, it is 11. So um, uh, welcome from uh, New York, uh, Columbia University. Uh, I'm Ellie Noah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Bill, for organizing the session. Thank you, speakers. Thank you, uh, participants. Uh, this is uh, obviously an important topic uh, worldwide, but Europeans have taken the initiative. It's about the relationship of the uh, infrastructure providers, ISPs, uh, with the um, people are using the networks, uh, content providers, applications providers, CAPS. Uh, there is, in principle, nothing new and unusual about this situation of infrastructure versus users. It's always been there. The railroads uh, and the farmers have fought it over in the 19th century in the United States that actually led to federal regulation and state regulation of infrastructure. Uh, cable companies with the content networks are constantly fighting over. Uh, uh, rates, electric transmission systems and power generators, gas pipelines with gas producers, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, so, the, so usually uh, the market power lies with the infrastructure for kind of obvious reasons, uh, large capital investments, high, uh, 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 high economies of scale, et cetera, that leads to a very few uh, if a uh, monopoly or a very few handful of uh, providers. And so usually the users have to be protected from monopoly pricing. Uh, there are some instances in which there might be, but very rare, uh, where there might be monopsony pricing where the user is so powerful that the infrastructure provider have to uh, uh, bend in their direction. And I was trying to think of some examples and I couldn't find good examples. One is the... Uh, uh, in the old system, the postal service with the airlines. Uh, so they obviously they were a huge customer uh, for uh, mail delivery type, uh, and so they could dictate prices. So, but normally the price regulation or price intervention is to uh, to keep prices down uh, rather than to raise prices. Uh, so uh, in this situation here that we're talking about, we do have very strong uh, strong. ISP companies, uh, telcos, et cetera. Uh, we do a fairly concentrated industry. We also have a, uh, but we also have on the other side, a number of very large users, um, ca large caps, uh, Google, Facebook, et cetera. Um, and so one would think that this is a situation where there's some bargaining power on both sides and therefore let commercial negotiations take uh, uh, do its job. But there's a third factor here, and that is kind of that there is some externalities to infrastructure and governments have been kind of um, talked, uh, uh, thinking about kind of how can we upgrade our infrastructure. Um, uh, uh, and and so, so that is certainly one way. In traditionally infrastructure, there's externalities. The externalities were sometimes given by cross subsidization of some sort, but sometimes direct subsidies from government. But here, I think some governments have also discovered a pocket there, which are the large uh, providers of content. And uh, to some convenient sense for Europe politically, uh, they tend to be American companies, maybe some Chinese companies. So in some ways, it lets, leads me, and I will conclude now to question, in a way, is this part, and I will put these questions provocatively, is this a situation in a question, why should California-based companies that have been small and innovative and then have become large and successful and have given the world a lot of kind of remarkable uh, features, why should these companies pay to subsidize the telecom infrastructure in Bavaria or Calabria? Shouldn't uh, German or Italian governments do so or German or Italian companies do so? Conversely, I would ask the question from the other side, which is, would California customers expect that a delivery of beer from Bavaria or wine from Calabria uh, should travel through the United States for free? Uh, 
Uh, and so both of these questions are in some ways the questions that underlie the discussion that we will have today. Um, uh, and it will be moderated by the organizer, Bill Drake, uh, who is CIT NICE, Columbia Institute for Teleinformation, Director of International Studies. Bill has also a PhD in political science from Columbia, so he has come back. Uh, in between, he has done many interesting things in Washington, uh, Georgetown University, Carnegie Institute. Um, he has been also with uh, uh, the University of California in San Diego. Uh, with the World Economic Forum in a variety of capacities. Uh, he is well connected, well informed about these issues, and I'm very glad to pass this on to Bill. Go ahead. Thanks, Ellie, for that interesting introduction. And uh, actually, I'm more confused about these issues than anything else, but that's fine. Hopefully, today is going to clarify everything for me. So, this is part of a series on global digital governance that we've been running since October with monthly meetings. Uh, this is the fifth meeting. Our next meeting, just to tell you, will be in four weeks on Tuesday, April 18th. Normally we're on Thursday, but especially we'll do a Tuesday one because I will really be at a UN meeting on internet governance on the on the relevant Thursday. Uh, today, we're going to be uh, taking a, some time to dig into this whole uh, battle that's taking place within Europe, which really has, I think, broader global implications that have not gotten sufficient attention. So some of this will sound very you know, EU, uh, I can't say inside baseball because that doesn't work in the European context, about in, inside football. Uh, uh, <laughs> soccer, soccer. Soccer. And the soccer is not <laughs> an acceptable term in Europe. But anyway, um, but, but hopefully uh, people will see uh, the broader significance. Um, you know, much of the energy uh, in discussions these days around global digital governance is focused on new technologies like AI, crypto, social media, et cetera. But there are a lot of longstanding parts of the ecosystem that involve big money and extensive governance and international cooperation. And one of these, of course, is uh, the, the rules for uh, uh, networks to distribute and terminate, terminate traffic, especially at the international level. And in fact, uh, I mean, this is my interest, uh, you know, going back to the very beginning, the origins of international cooperation and communications really started with, you know, the 1850 Treaty of Dresden and a lot of it had to do with setting the rules for interconnecting and handing off traffic and who gets paid for what. Uh, and of course that was then followed through with all the subsequent international rules set in the International Telecommunication Union and other bodies. And uh, this was, you know, the work in particular of uh, national monopolies that were governmental entities, ministries of post telegraph telephone, PTTs, and uh, later their private counterparts in weird countries like the US. And then in the 60s, we had the International Accounting and Settlement System, which was even more ornate in its rules and uh, bureaucratic procedures. But all of it was based on the notion that the sending party network would bill the customer for outbound traffic and then make payments to the inbound network for transit and termination. So sender, sender party network pays, SPNP was basically the, the broad concept. And uh, this uh, prevailed for a very long time until the late 1990s when this kind of cartel like uniformity was broken apart by liberalization, privatization of the PTTs, the entry of the WTO to the space and so on. The internet of course was always fundamentally different than the way it did things. From the 1990s, for the emergence of commercial internet, large backbone carriers peered with each other, tier ones, to exchange traffic without negotiating compensation based on volume uh, and just worked on a system of sender keeps all. Uh, the smaller ISPs paid for transit to reach the whole internet. And of course, over time, the internet uh, to topography evolved and changed with the arrival of internet exchange points and other means of uh, collecting and distributing traffic, and then evolved even further with the growth of uh, industry consolidation, the appearance of content delivery networks that flattened the net and reduced the demand for transit, all kinds of things. Uh, but the point is that this model of peering and interconnection was key to the internet's uninhibited growth and role as a uh, growth pole for innovation without permission. But this has become uh, challenged today. Uh, this once comparatively unexciting realm of interconnection has become the focal point of a huge global debate within the EU that may have significant implications for the world. European public telecom operators or telcos have been arguing for at least a decade that compensation from their customers was not enough uh, to do the investments they need to make in broadband and they should receive compensation from the originators of internet traffic 
this question shot up the agenda internationally in 2012 at the ITU's hugely contested World Conference and International Telecom Wicket in Dubai, where thousands of delegates, including myself, gathered to debate the revision of the International uh, Telecom uh, Treaty uh, and decide whether what should be applied to the internet. And uh, it was uh, quite a quite a battle, I would say. And in that heated environment, the European telcos coordinated in ETNO, the European Telecommunications Network Operators Association, to propose global treaty language saying, uh, and I quote, operating agencies shall negotiate commercial agreements to achieve a sustainable system of fair compensation for telecom services and where appropriate, respect the principle of sending party network pays. So this is the complete opposite of the traditional internet interconnection kind of model. They were opposed by the body of European regulators for electronic communications in Europe, BEREC, and a global multi-stakeholder pro-internet coalition. And ultimately the proposal failed as did the, the whole negotiation. It was the biggest diplomatic catastrophe in the history of global communications. Uh, but anyway, now we have a renewed campaign. Uh, South Korea implemented a version of center party network pays in 2016 and a targeted Netflix law uh, thereafter. Um, and uh, in 2021, 2022, European telcos began to push again to receive payments in exchange for terminating traffic, uh, focusing their fire in particular on large content and application providers, CAPS, that happen to be based in the United States, uh, from whom their customers request a lot of bits. And they've coordinated through Etno and some other industry associations to advance this uh, agenda. And uh, the EU's digital commissioner, uh, and ex France uh, telecom CEO Thierry Breton has been a, a leading voice for digital sovereignty and a critic of US big tech, has been enthusiastically welcoming the proposal and other parts of the commission uh, have endorsed or seem very open to it as well. And some members of parliament, the European parliament and civil society groups demanded a more open discussion uh, as did Barrick, the regulators. Uh, and so now we have going on right now a 12-week public consultation that ends May 19, which is not just on this issue, it's a broader look at how Europe should configure itself in the digital environment, but this is certainly an important part of it, and the questionnaire uh, that was distributed is quite <laughs> telco-friendly, I would say, but it's a, it's a huge battle going on, kind of a single-issue mini-wicket uh, that involves all the players in the internet ecosystem. So uh, it's very consequential, and we want to explore it. And to do so, we have a panel of leading expert participants in the debate, three people uh, from Europe. Uh, first is Rudolf van der Berg. He's a partner at Stratix Consulting, the leading telecom and digital economy consultancy of the Netherlands. Previously, he was a regulatory affairs manager at Tele2, a senior policy advisor at the OECD, a management consult consultant at Logica Management Consulting, and a policy manager at the Dutch Ministry of Economic Affairs. Michael Kendi, uh, sorry, he's joining from the Netherlands. Michael Kendi is joining from Switzerland. He's a senior advisor for Analysis Mason Consulting and a digital development specialist with the World Bank Group. Previously, Michael was chief economist at the Internet Society and a visiting lecturer at the Graduate Institute for International and Development Studies in Geneva. He's uh, the author of several important uh, white papers on IP interconnection, as well as a book called The Digital Handshake. Uh, and he come, he was a MIT uh, economics PhD and knows uh, the way this uh, topography works well. Finally, uh, Marit uh, Palo, Palo Virta is Senior Director for Regulatory Affairs at the European Telecommunications Network Operators Association at No, mentioned previously. We're very happy that she was willing to join us and explain the telco positions. Um, previously, uh, she was managed, she held management roles at the Internet Society and in Cisco Systems and worked in well-known Brussels-based consultancies, uh, and she's coming from Belgium. So we'll do uh, five or six rounds of, of questions to, with Tro de Tab uh, and a little back and forth, hopefully, and then we'll open it up to discussion. I see a lot of uh, people in the room who know a lot about this arena, so hopefully we can have a, a good uh, open discussion after the panel. So that's the agenda. Well, let's dive in. Um, so let me start with the first question. Uh, and I guess, uh, Marit, it makes sense for you to take, take the lead on this one. Uh, what are the core economic arguments being advanced by the telcos about traffic patterns, revenues, and in their investment requirements? Uh, what are the counter arguments on these points that have been advanced by opponents? What's the, what's the 
core economic uh, proposition we're dealing with here. Please go ahead and explain that to us. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Bill, and uh, good good morning to you, I guess, in the US uh, today, afternoon already here in Europe, and uh, thanks a lot for the invitation for this uh, event. I'm sensing that there's a uh, lot of good topics to be discussed already, but indeed, I'll, I'll try and start with, um, let's say, the if you like, the problem statement uh, from our side. Maybe just uh, two words on Etno before we start. So we were talking about a concentrated industry in the introduction at some stage. And just to give you an idea of what the situation is in Europe. So at Etno, we have 33 members, operators, who represent about 70% of the investment footprint in Europe. But um, due to the state of the market in Europe, we actually do have hundreds of operators in Europe. And you could say about 100, let's say, good size operators. So the market is not perhaps as concentrated as it is in, in the US. But that aside, so going into the problem. So for us, this is really a problem about investment and investment gap and return on investment from our point of view. And uh, the challenge is really with private investment in telecoms markets. So you may know that in Europe, we have quite a lot of public funding available, but that's not where we see the issue. And just to give you some idea on the investment numbers. So in 2021, operators in Europe invested some 56 billion euros on networks. And that was actually a record high since 2016. So you would think that things are going fairly well. But then when you look at the private investment per capita and compare that with, for example, the US. So this only represents two thirds of the investment that you guys are having in the US or less than a half of the investment in Japan. And if we're continuing at the current pace of investment, we have an estimate that about 45 million Europeans will not have gigabit connectivity by 2030. And as you know, in the US, that's a clear political uh, priority. And that's also the case here in Europe. So there is a coverage issue still in Europe, number one. So then when we start digging into the investment challenge, what is behind there? So maybe the first thing I would like to raise is the data traffic volumes. And, and this is of course something that, you know, has, has come up in the discussion a lot. We have seen an exponential increase in data traffic volumes. Um, and we don't see from our side, uh, you know, an end to this trend. We have great new content coming up, new services, apps, metaverse, and what have you, high, higher definition video. So we expect that, the growth will continue. And because of these data traffic volumes, operators, of course, have to continually invest also in capacity. So three dimension networks, upgrade networks, etc. And so here we come to the capacity issue. So there's a coverage issue, but there's also then a capacity issue. And here's where you may say, but hey, well, you're operators. So that's your job, isn't it? So, you know, you should just make it happen. Well, ideally, that would be the case. However, in Europe, and it was already referred to, I think we do have quite a specific regulatory framing in the area of, of telecoms. So we are subject to regulation, including very specific pricing regulation. So telecom operators' prices are regulated partially at the wholesale level, but also at consumer level. We have a competition policy that is quite clearly against mergers. So as I said, market is very fragmented. And at the moment, we do not really see any possibility to increase economies of scale, uh, let's say organically through mergers. And then we have the um, regulation on the open internet, which is the net neutrality regulation, if you like. And while we, of course, endorse fully the principles behind the open internet regulation, and we agree that this is a great thing for the end users, but there is an issue what this regulation does to uh, the commercial relationships. So the regulation basically says that operators are obliged to carry all traffic, all content to end users without blocking, throttling, or any discrimination, which is, as we said, great for end users. But this, of course, let's say puts a little bit of a bias if you look at the relationship between on one hand operators and then on, on the content providers. So we have an obligation to carry all the content to the end user. 
So this is where we see this kind of imbalance in the internet ecosystem or the digital ecosystem rather starting. So one hand, you have operators who invest and on the other side, then you have content providers. And here I would like to be more specific, especially the large global internet giants that extract most value out of the networks through different business models, multi-sided markets, data, advertising, etc. So when we put this kind of all together, we see that then those commercial negotiations that should be taking place at the kind of IP interconnection level that I guess is the concrete point of contact when these negotiations would be taking place, we clearly have an asymmetry. So at the moment, the results of those commercial negotiations are rather poor for the operators. And they certainly go nowhere near to be, let's say, fully um, compensate, well, fully compensating the, the traffic that is pushed push through or is passing through the networks. And you talked a little bit about the peering. We know today that while in the past, of course, there was this kind of principle of symmetric traffic and, and the kind of good tradition of peering based on that. Today, that's no longer the, no longer the case. So traffic is, is no longer symmetric. And actually, even historically, between large players, a paid peering has been um, a standard already for, for quite a while. So this is really the, 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 the kind of the underlying reason where we see the commercial and regulatory asymmetry between operators and the large internet providers. And um, that's why we have, let's say, um, started the discussion about the financial sustainability of the ecosystem in the digital, um, the digital world, but also then very specifically the relationship between operators on one hand and then these large content providers who are currently not regulated uh, to, to a significant extent in the European markets. So maybe I'll just stop here as a kind of initial introduction. That was that was very helpful. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, which of the two gentlemen would like to reply first, Rudolf, Michael? Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. All right. Uh, so uh, thank you for the introduction. It's nice to see the names of a lot of uh, familiar people, if not the faces. Um, and uh, just just kind of in uh, hi Jonathan, <laughs> just kind of going back uh, when I was at the FCC in the late 1990s, I wrote the paper that Bill mentioned. Uh, the digital handshake, talking about why internet interconnection hasn't needed to be regulated. Um, I've written on quite a bit on that since then, including with Analysis Mason, two papers, uh, one for Encompass in the US, kind of looking at a, uh, taking a global view of, um, of this debate, the infrastructure investments of the uh, CAPS, which I'll get to in a moment, and the impact of the network usage fees and one for that was targeted more at Europe on the European cloud companies by for the European cloud companies for about the impact it would have on them. I'll, I'll try and drop those into chat later uh, in this discussion. So, I mean, I think, first of all, it's it, it's worth pointing out that the track it the traffic is really being generated by the customers of the broadband. It's not being pushed out by the caps to congest networks. Uh, it's not like phone calls where you know who initiated the call and then calling party pays that, that Bill described makes sense because you know who initiated it, they know who initiated it, and they respond to the price signals of all the prices built in. Uh, in the Encompass paper, we talked about traffic sensitivity and showed that in general, the traffic network costs are not that uh, traffic sensitive. We showed uh, while traffic went up 160 percent between 2018 and 2021, uh, the opex and the, the operating and the capital expenditures went up just three percent. Um, because once the networks are configured, uh, particularly the fiber ones, uh, there's not that much extra cost with capacity. Obviously, investments need to take place um, to to get those networks in place. Um, and in terms of the asymmetry of the traffic, as, as Marit said, obviously there's much more traffic going down than up. I mean, that was designed into ADSL. That's the A in ADSL. And, and it's clear that um, most people are receiving much more traffic than they're sending out. Um, but to compensate that, the internet companies have made significant investments in infrastructure to push 
content closer and closer to users, um, building data centers around the world, uh, transport networks, uh, delivery with uh, the CDNs, with caches, to put the content closer and closer, particularly video and static content closer and closer to the end user, lowering the cost for the ISPs and um, making the latency lower so the quality of service is better and better. Uh, in the Encompass paper, we showed that uh, total expenditure on those three things, hosting, transport, and delivery, since 2011 was 883 billion. Um, and just in Europe alone in the last few years is an average of about 24 billion uh, on infrastructure, including hosting, which is the majority of it. Um, but there's also significant investments in content services and, and research and development uh, in all the advanced services that are coming our way. And, and that clearly is, a, is a, an expenditure and that's ultimately what, what brings people online um, to use um, to use the internet. So we recognize that there is a regulatory mandate to, to build out investment um, to, to reach the digital decade and, and get gigabit everywhere in Europe. I would just argue that um, taking a system that's working today that is internet interconnection um, and, and there's no reason to break that because of a different problem. Um, there's no reason, and we can talk about what that would do uh, if, if this starts to be regulated, but there's no reason to regulate and, and, and to break one system to address an, another regulatory uh, issue and challenge. So I'll, I'll pause there. And um... Great. Thank you. Rudolph. Yeah, it's, um, it's funny. I've been posting some links in the chat for people to see because this is the zombie debate that comes from the grave every night, five years or so. Um, there's always seen the meetings from 94 and 96, where incumbent telcos from Europe are complaining about the Americans already. We've got Kopf of uh, Deutsche Telekom was very angry about unlimited traffic in 2001, uh, giving about the Americans even then. And um, in 2011, we had the Edmund proposal as well. The main problem with every, every time is that the incumbents never provide any real data. So they create bogus reports with bad calculations and then hope that politicians follow them. For example, on the investment cap, um, Edno publishes a really nice report, partially with my analysis, Mason, on uh, statistics for Europe, the digital art, uh, or what's it called again, uh, yeah, Edno State of Digital Communications. It shows that uh, alternative telcos, so not Edno members, are actually far ahead in FTTH investment. So the reason some places in Europe, such as Germany, are behind in FDTH investment is because their incumbent hasn't done much. Most of it came from alternative providers. But there are other places, like Spain now has 90%, 80-90% FDTH. France is almost done finishing a national project to fiber up all rural areas. And um, its incumbents have also invested. Okay. Orange is a million homes behind. There's a bit of a fight about who needs to pay for them. But, uh, literally, French villages see a digging crew show up on Monday. And on Friday, everybody in the village has FDTH and all the copper has been disconnected. That's the kind of stuff France is good at and they have achieved. Um, if we then look at the traffic, every EU telco and Barrick has said that EU networks handled COVID traffic increases really well. Uh, we just heard about F exponential growth in traffic. Well, uh, that's a mathematical trick because when something grows, you can always put an exponent to it, but it can be very, very small. So actual average traffic growth, according to KPN and BT, is 21% per year. But the traffic per user, KPN budgets in its wholesale offer, 
is six megabits. So here you are, big telco, building a fiber optic network with which you budget six megabits of traffic for and 21% growth. So all of the Netherlands, 8 million homes, fits in 48 terabits. That sounds like a lot. But if you know that Nokia now builds a router, a European designed and built router, that handles 230 terabits, that the nice people in Belgium of Proximus actually built their networks around 100 terabit routers. And, you know, smaller countries, so they have like 36 terabits. A single box could handle the whole country. Of course, no smart person should run the whole country through one single router. Please do that through multiple locations and redundancy, etc. And of course, nobody should send all traffic through a single box. Of course, you do local interconnection. Of course, you do local caching. We're not idiots. Keep the stuff local, and you don't have to do the backhaul either, which is why some EU telcos, such as KPN, have local caches like every 30 kilometers has a local cache for Netflix and stuff because it saved the wholesale department well, and the networking department money. It costed the wholesale department money because they wanted to have cost. And one final nitpick, peering has never been about symmetric traffic. Not any time in history has that been relevant. It's about how much you save on transit. And smaller networks, because the internet is 75,000 networks, would generally pay more for transit. So they would benefit the most. And it's not about what direction it goes, because you pay always. When I started my work at an internet exchange in 2001, we paid uh, 10,000 euro for two megabits in the east of the Netherlands. When we got an internet exchange, it dropped to 2,000. That's a lot of savings. But it didn't matter which direction it went. So there's a lot of misinformation. There's a lot of incompetence. But the reality is, if you can't handle current traffic loads, if you complain about traffic and say it costs you too much, you haven't looked at your firm's investors presentations because both Vodafone, BT, Orange, and all others have said that they can handle traffic loads really well. Vodafone even has a slight thing. Traffic is growing fast, but costs of traffic are falling faster. Uh, 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 wait a minute. So the reality is, oh yeah, and also the reality is incumbent dumpers charge. Orange, uh, RCEP, the French regulator says that transit costs in France are around 10 to 20 cents per megabit. But Orange charges for private interconnect and connections to its transit provider up to several euro per megabit. That's known as a termination monopoly. Deutsche Telekom showed that during COVID, it would go as far as forcing Deutsche Forschungsnet, the German universities, to pay for a 100 gig link because Deutsche Telekom had 20% traffic loss in its network, but it told Deutsche Forschungsnetz that the students could go to hell. If they couldn't follow classes, Deutsche Forschungsnetz had to pay. Not even Telefonica and Vodafone went that far. They said they gave free interconnection direct PNIs to the event. And mind you, the event already had over a terabit of interconnectivity. So, okay. Great. Thank you very much, Rudolf. That's very interesting. Uh, could, I'm still kind of like a little bit puzzled. So I just want to follow up real quickly. Myra, maybe just help me understand. So uh, big telco is big. Uh, if you look at the market caps, the assets, and so on, it's you know hundreds of billions of dollars. Companies of global reach, some like Telefonica are all over the world. I'm a happy Deutsche Telekom customer here in New York. These companies are not poor. They ask is that... Well, 
the, the ask is that the state would intermediate in their commercial relationships and force one set of large companies to give mo money to another set of large companies. And I'm wondering how would that actually work operationally? Um, I mean, uh, Deutsche Telekom, Orange Telefonica, they count the bits that they can think they can attribute to, to uh, Google and they send them a bill, is the state involved? Uh, what happens if they disagree, disagree with the assessment, refuse to pay? Uh, wouldn't they just pass along the cost to the customer? I, I, I'm, I'm just, the fundamentals of it, I'm still struggling with. So if you could just help me a little bit more on that, that'd be great. Okay, yeah, sure. I'm happy to do that. So um, yes, how would we do that? So we are not looking at, I mean, I was I was trying to explain that, of course, our sector has been subject to this kind of where very heavy regulatory burden, ex ante regulation, et cetera, et cetera. So we are not here saying that, yes, we are, we have been suffering from this and still are. So, you know, the other guys should be so as well. What we are looking here is a very targeted solution, not a sending party pace model, like, you know, the misunderstanding is, is often been in the, in the press, but a very targeted tool, policy tool, that would help us to have those commercial negotiations with the other party, and especially with those large internet giants that today are not coming to the negotiation table because they do not need to. They have the open internet regulation in Europe guaranteeing that whether they negotiate or not at the commercial level, operators will have to deliver the traffic till the end user. And so there would be some kind of an obligation to negotiate simply to have those commercial negotiations that in our view should be taking place under normal circumstances. We have one public court case at the moment in Europe Deutsche Telekom sued Meta on this issue because Meta stopped paying. Um, I don't know the details. I don't want to comment on it. I think there's some information if you look on the internet. But it is that bad that, you know, commercial negotiations are not taking place. So from our point of view, number one, we should make sure that those commercial negotiations take place and there will be some kind of a price negotiation. The price negotiation should take place on commercial terms from our point of view. It need not be um, regulated, et cetera, so commercial terms. But of course, as we know, sometimes these negotiations are difficult. So, you know, should that not, should there not be agreement, then we should have some type of an arbitration mechanism to make sure that we actually come to an agreement. And that's where then the public body, whatever competent authority, whether that's a regulator or somebody else, would step in to kind of um, guide the way. Of course, we also fully expect that you know, any contribution would need to go on investment. I was trying to highlight the investing investment gaps um, earlier on. And we fully expect also that there will be some kind of requirements for accountability, that there will be some kind of governance around this, because otherwise, of course, um, well, we understand that uh, the policymakers would have perhaps hard time justifying and, and putting forward any kind of policy tool. I would like to also mention about the IP pairing in general that, you know, there's this still this kind of, um, well, very idealistic view about how pairing and transit work, how, how the IP interconnection works. And I would also like to say that, yes, on one hand, you have the kind of pairing and transit, but also CDNs, you can see the other side of it. So today, actually, CDNs are also a substitute in a way for pairing and transit. And I think that even Analysis Mason recognizes that in, in one of their reports, and Barrett certainly does when they look at in, in one of the recent reports on the internet ecosystem. And when you look at the CDNs that come to Europe, many of them are actually proprietary. They're not regulated. They are outside the regulation. So you have then operators who are heavily regulated, trying to compete with transit, traditional transit on the interconnection, against other parties who are using a new business model, which has many, many benefits. And we're not at all, let's say, uh, contesting that, but you know, other players who are not regulated. So we see also a little bit of an imbalance there. And that's maybe a market definition problem from the European side, um, from the regulator side. 
So this is a little bit how, how we see it at today, but we also, uh, you know, there are many details, of course, and, and policymakers uh, no doubt have their own ideas and, and other things, but that would be our current instinct on, on how this could be implemented. Okay, so the idea is that the state would effectively force parties to the table to negotiate with each other. So then the question becomes, uh, which parties? So you've, you've argued that the proposal, or Etno and the telcos have argued, that the proposals would only apply to the largest caps, the largest uh, content and application providers. Uh, a lot of the opponents seem to think that uh, the proposals would inevitably negatively impact a wider range of actors across the ecosystem. How would we ensure that the impact here would only be on these big players that you say you're targeting? Rudolph had his hand up. Let's let's start with him, and and let's let's try to stick to three minutes each so we can get through a number of rounds of questions. Thank you. Yeah, um, there's something weird about the argument. On the one hand, we're talking about an investment gap. So then you would think we would focus on countries that don't meet the EU target of one gigabit per household in 2030. So we would talk about how do we get Germany fiber? How do we get Greece fiber? Um, but then when we're talking about the proposal, it's about charging every other network that's not a net member basically for trap. But and also forcing them to negotiate, which is a weird thing because the internet is a network of interconnected networks, um, 75,000. And as also present in uh, telephony, there's transit parties. So you can't interconnect with everybody directly. So you can also buy transit. What Ethno basically wants is to end the option of buying transit and have it possibly to purchase from the local telco, which would create a termination monopoly. Um, in Germany, Meta basically took up Deutsche Telekom on its thread and said, well, you say that we're transit customer, so we stop being a customer and we cancel our contract and we'll buy transit from somebody else. Somehow that's not, not allowed. So it's only allowed to pay directly to Deutsche Telekom and Deutsche Telekom doesn't feel that it needs to handle transit through another route. So it's now trying to force Meta to stay a customer, which is weird, you know, because either you're a customer and you can leave or you're not a customer, but then somebody is exploiting a termination and all. And this makes it really hard because on the one hand, the child could say this is necessary for our investment, but why would we pay Telefonica then when they're done with FTTH investment? Why would we not all pay the Greeks to actually get fiber everywhere? We hear that it's because there's so much traffic, but then we also hear they had a broadband of war and saying, oh, Nokia makes these nice routers, we can handle all our traffic in them. Um, so there's a lot of disinformation here about what is really going on. Okay. It's almost like it's jealousy or it's an aversion tactic for some of the other policies that have been proposed at the same time. For example, deregulating and bundling rates in Europe, which are currently regulated, and as we heard, to help us think that they are really heavily taxed by them. Mind you, they're all profitable. But yeah, um, it's a really weird argument. Okay, but so how do we keep it focused on just the biggest players that only they are being asked to negotiate? For it? Because lots of people are using uh, Amazon cloud service. I mean, there's a lot of other players that could be, I, I read people from the public broadcasting world saying this is gonna impact us in Europe. So. How do you keep it tightly focused? Michael, uh, Kendi, do you have thoughts on, on how, did, how could that work? Can't hear you. Sorry. 
Yeah, no, um, I mean, I have some other thoughts on the negotiations, but I'll answer your question. Um, I mean, I think it's difficult. I think that we still haven't gotten to the bottom of the question of what happens if the negotiations fail and a regulation is imposed or traffic is not accepted. That would seem to be a violation of net neutrality. Um, but I think also, as you as you alluded with Amazon Cloud, um, you know, the some of the biggest companies um, have CDNs, proprietary or or not. Some of them are cloud companies, and we're all customers at the end of the day of cloud companies. Broadcasters use them to deliver traffic. Governments use them. Gaming companies, small content providers, and to the extent that the network usage fees are higher than would be negotiated, um, there may be less investment in CDN or infrastructure, there may be less investment in content or uh, prices may go up and, and, and that will impact, um, ultimately can, could impact everyone using cloud services. Um, so I, th I think that's, uh, that's the answer if it really focuses on the largest and that includes cloud um, content and cloud traffic, then, then it will impact anyone using the cloud at the end of the day. So Marit, how do you avoid that? Yeah, just to just to maybe say on the on the net neutrality. So of course, in this negotiation scenario, if negotiations fall through, we are still subject to the net neutrality regulation. So traffic keeps on going. This is a parallel uh, scheme that we are seeing, and the European Commission on many occasions have publicly actually confirmed this that net neutrality and this fair contribution, fair and proportionate contribution, which is now enshrined in EU policy, are in fact pa parallel initiatives. But on the on, on the sorry, scope, how, so how does that work? Just how does that work? Uh, maybe I don't understand network neutrality anymore, or maybe I just don't understand it in the EU context. You're saying some originators of content shall be treated differently from an economic and a technological standpoint, but that's consistent with network neutrality. Well, the EU regulation says, as I said earlier, that all traffic should be delivered to the end user. And that would not change without discrimination. So all traffic would be going to the uh, end user. But the net neutrality regulation, of course, doesn't, the, the commercial negotiations are not really in the in the scope of it as such. So, so then you can uh, talk about the principles of net neutrality, of course, beyond uh, the EU regulation, but but that's where we've been, at least in the public discourse, also heard the European Commission drawing the line. But on the, um, on the scope, so we do see that data traffic volumes is a key determinant. So clearly those companies who are actually, uh, well, uh, generating, if you like, uh, most data traffic or originators of most data traffic, um, that's, that's one criteria. But we do think also that there should be maybe some other criteria and you, some of you may be aware of the recent EU regulations on the Digital Markets Act, Digital Single uh, Services Act. And there, for example, there are criteria that are looking at the footprint in Europe. So companies that are present in three or more European countries, I think there's some economic uh, indicators, so turnover, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that it's absolutely in nobody's interest to have spillovers to companies that are not the source of the problem. And I'm also wanting to touch here on the asymmetry. For example, at national level, we of course have important players, content players like broadcasters and, and what have you, national public broadcasters. But they're typically, the relationship, the commercial relationship is, is more symmetrical. So there, there are probably very tough commercial negotiations taking place but there is a result. There are negotiations taking place. So our members are not seeing a problem at that level. It's really at the level where we see this market asymmetry. Okay. And, and just to maybe just one more comment on, on the points that it's only Edna members benefiting from it. That's not at all true. So we have been very clear that we would like the whole ecosystem to benefit from this small and large operators. And you will have seen certainly public statements from very different types of operators, network operators in Europe in support of the initiative. So we do believe that there's a way to make sure that the whole ecosystem benefits. There have also been statements from 
smaller ISPs and so on saying they don't need this. So that confuses me, but okay, I take your point. Um, Michael, were you trying to get in on this or Rudolf? Yeah, Rudolf. I, I, just, yeah. I just wanted, oh, well, I just wanted to point out very briefly that, uh, I mean, there is paid peering that comes out of uh, negotiations. Um, and uh, I think RCEP keeps track of um, peering uh, arrangements. They have a, a annual or biannual report. And they, I think the last one said that something like 42% of traffic goes under paid peering. Now it's clearly not enough to pay for gigabit networks to every rural area of France, uh, but that's not typically a part of the negotiations. And again, I think that's something between the operators and the EU that are that's the ones ultimately asking for those networks and, and asking for them to be built. Um, and putting it into interconnection uh, is a roundabout way of, of and that, that will impact a system that's been working very, very well for the past 30 years at what it's meant to do. And it's meant to deliver traffic, not, not pay for, uh, for new infrastructure investment. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Rudolf? Yeah, it's, um, one of the things that uh, Mount just did was misrepresent what the EU actually agreed. The EU ag agreed that all market actors benefiting from digital transformation assume their social responsibilities and make a fair and proportionate contributions to the costs of public goods, services, and infrastructures for the benefit of all people living in the EU. So it's public goods, services, and infrastructures that should have a fair contribution. So it's not just infrastructure who needs to get some money. Um, and as a result, this whole debate gets distorted into just being about infrastructure, but people do pay. Um, network, CDNs, etc., do pay. They save telcos a lot of money. CDNs are actually, were actually invented to replace caches in the 2000s that telcos invested in to save on traffic costs. And CDNs changed the business model so that the person sending uh, or generating the traffic in their website actually paid somebody to distribute it around the world and saved the telcos money and also made it easier for telcos because they didn't have to maintain a big box that was always behind the times and it was always costing more money. So the market has come up with an absolute brilliant way of running traffic around the world of 75,000 participants. And everybody can do what, what they want. In France, 40 to 60% of traffic is paid to the telco. In the UK, it's almost nothing. But it's not too much, and it doesn't affect in investment. The reality is EU telcos of all stripes are very profitable. Unbundled local loop uh, telcos, so, so the alternative telcos who hire the wires from the EU telcos pay a price that has a good margin on it, but it generally also is, includes traffic. So they already pay. In the Netherlands, it's one euro 39 for six megabits. Where does the extra money need to come from? And the statement then is they don't want to negotiate. Yes, they do. But if Deutsche Telekom or France Telekom charges five euro per megabit or two euro per megabit, can I then also just go to another network and buy just buy transit? Or should I just pay what I want? Well, that's what we call it. A termination rate, a termination monopoly. Hey, we know that from mobile. When Orange in the Netherlands increased the termination rate for mobile to 25 cents a minute because it had a budget shortage in 2001. And it's all old. Okay. All right. Uh, thanks for that, uh, Rudolf. Marit, I mean, I think there's obviously a lot of interesting uh, questions on the table here, and people are very curious in, in your views here. So it's been very helpful. And one thing I, I, there are two bits I just wanted to follow up real quick. One, one was on the investment itself. Uh, we, we do know that the, the caps, the big uh, content providers are investing massive amounts of money, billions of dollars 
in building infrastructure in EU. Um, but somehow the discourse that I'm getting from the telco side is like they're not doing that, and so we have to carry the cost. I'm not understanding why their investments are not being counted as relevant here. The other part though, I'm really not understanding is you you insist that this is not sender network party pays, but that's precisely what Etno proposed in the wicket negotiations verbatim. How's this different from that? Who, if it's not the sender network party that would be paying, who is it that would be paying? I don't, I, I'm not understanding that. Yes, so your first question, sorry, I, lo I lost it. <laughs> I'm just saying that, the, that the, the, the caps are investing billions. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Right? So yes. the argument that yes, indeed. Uh, have to carry all the burden seems odd to me. No, no. Um, so uh, indeed, I mean, we of course recognize, I mean, CAPS are investing a lot of money on uh, submarine cables, uh, CDN, uh, cloud, etc. As I was saying earlier, many of these infrastructures are proprietary. We also know that now with the uh, development of edge cloud in Europe, we are seeing that also CAPS are starting to invest in last mile connectivity based on edge cloud uh, through different types of uh, LAN, LAN wireless solutions, etc. So effectively, CAPS are, of course, investing in the connectivity market. I mean, I'm making here a differentiation between network investment and, and cloud investment, which, of course, supports connectivity, but we in Europe at least don't count it as, as networks. But the big problem here is that because of the infrastructures are proprietary, CAPs are not currently regulated at all in Europe. So we have price regulation on the traditional vertically integrated telco in Europe. We have different types of regulation now, so I, was, I don't want to repeat it. And at the moment, these newcomers, if you like, are not subject to the same regulation. And you may say what you want, but of course, regulation, it is a cost. It does, you know, limit your availability to, I mean, to invest, but also to innovate. And, and that's just the, the bottom of it. And, and this comes in different shapes and form, forms in Europe, but, but that's really where we see the, the, the um, uh, symmetry. Mm -hmm. And how is it not center party pays? Yeah, so we, okay. So there was a discussion in 2012. I wasn't fortunately, unfortunately, uh, part of the discussion back then. But um, we are not here looking at the blatant kind of blanket sending party pays thing, as I was trying to explain. This is a very targeted approach, trying to address those pain points that we have in the commercial negotiations. We are not seeking for contribution from all content providers across the board. That's not the kind of policy that we are trying to uh, you know, promote here. So, so that's really, it's, it's, it's much more targeted uh, from our point of view. Um, and and that's, that's, the, that's the main difference. So this is from our point of view, it is, it is simply much more based on the current market conditions and the asymmetries, both in regulation, but also in the market, market so it's terms that we see. Customer of sender not party network. I don't okay. And uh, also going back we, to Michael's comment. So I mean, yeah, if I can also clarify going back to Michael's comment. So this is a fair and proportionate contribution that we are talking about in Europe. Network operators want to remain the pri the primary investor, of course, in networks. I mean, it is not that way. There's uh, some kind of a lookout for massive, massive, uh, you know, majority investment in networks. No, it is recognizing that these guys in the European context should play a role and contribute because of the circumstances and the regulatory framing. Okay, so we, I wanna to move towards the open discussion part pretty soon because we have a lot of people chatting in the chat, which shows a lot of interest on the part of the, the broader participant pool here. I just wanna ask one last question, kind of synthesizing some of the points we, we'd asked. What do we expect, the, what are the prospects now for what's going on with the European Commission? I mean, I, we, again, I remain puzzled that you know, the former CEO of Orange is in a position to make a decision about uh, what happens with Orange. But, uh, but more generally, I'm not understanding, how do we see what's gonna happen in the EU? How do we, what's the prediction of what's gonna happen in the EU and how that might, how might that impact the broader global internet? How, why should the rest of the world care what happens within the EU? Could, could people maybe come to that? Let's go start with Rudolph and then we'll go to open discussion. 
Well, um, you already see that what is happening in Europe has inspired India to ask the same questions. Of course, many African operators always were looking for this. In the US, the debate in Europe is now used as a sort of for the debate about the Universal Service Fund, which, well, is historically mismanaged by being paid by uh, 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 telephone rates for, for uh, long distance telephony. And there's proposals that this then needs to be paid by big content, also argued that Europe is debating this as well. Well, no, that's not what we're debating. So, um, what the effect of this will be will not be that big tech will be charged. Everybody will see this. Um, even telcos will notice it in their cost. For example, Telefonica hosts its corporate investor site on WordPress. Um, WordPress runs again on somebody else's infrastructure, and before you know it, you're paying. Everybody starts paying each other because it's a termination rate. What it also does, it will kill internet exchange points. Internet exchange points develop because transit costs, when they're high, make it useful to find an alternative route to a whole bunch of other networks. Now, most of the traffic is going through uh, private peering, but public peering gives you 80% of the other networks. When there's a termination rate that you need to pay, as we saw in telephony, there is no reason to peer because the termination network de determines the incoming routes. And there is, for the originating network, no way to save money. And as a result, to this day, in telephony, we see very little peering, very little uh, in the way of internet exchange points, but also very little comp uh, uh, competition. That's what I think. All right, but so uh, Michael, uh, what's your what's your sense of how this might how this might play in the EU and uh, what it means to the global internet? Well, I mean, I think I hope that uh, what Barrick said about it, which they've consistently said since 2012, plays some some weight. Uh, I think they came out quite strongly, um, I mean, in, in a preliminary assessment on the impact and need for this. It's not very different from what I would have written if they asked me to. Um, and uh, so, and I agree with Rudolph that it is being looked at in other countries. I would just urge countries to look at the experience of South Korea. And as you mentioned, Mike Nelson can, can speak to that example as well, but they've started six years ago um, you know, as the first country really to do this, first between ISPs, and then they've had to keep adjusting and adjusting. And it looks like more and more content is not being cached in country, requiring particularly smaller ISPs to spend money to, to go get it, uh, slowing down speeds. Uh, Twitch and other companies are not streaming or not streaming as a, at a high uh, resolution to not have to pay the fees. There's high transit costs. Um, so, you know, I would encourage that that's an example too. And I hope that they're looking at that one in Europe to, if it takes six years in Europe to uh, to do what they're trying to do in Korea, um, then the digital decade is over by then. And uh, hopefully the investments will have been made because nobody disputes that uh, those investments will, will be useful for all of us, um, for everyone in Europe. If this model were replicated, Michael, uh, by say developing countries, if they looked at the Europeans and said, ah, they did it, we'll do it too. How might that impact service in the developing world, for example? Well, I think that would be dangerous. I mean, no no company can can avoid investing in Europe, uh, right? I mean, it's you know, 500 million or whatever people, um, you know, a significant market for, for all of the particularly the big caps that that are, are the focus of this um, but they don't necessarily have to invest uh, certainly with caches with infrastructure with submarine cables to developing countries and and this came up already in the wicket 12 years ago and and admittedly that no proposal was much different back then 
Um, but that I think would be a, a significant mistake um, because it's easier to not invest in a country where you're not doing much business anyway. And, uh, you know, certainly these cloud companies and others provide really valuable services, content input in those countries. So I think that would be a much different impact. Okay. I'd like to open it up because I think we're at 1205. This is what I normally do. And uh, we've got a lot of people chatting in the chat. So hopefully some folks will feel compelled to raise questions with us. If any of the panelists have points that they didn't get to make because I was trying to move it along, you can always bring them back up in the context of responding to questions from the audience uh, from the broader participant pool. So let's open it up to the floor and see uh, if any of the folks who are chatting over here, I see many familiar names, uh, including some who have asked questions already, would like to raise their hand, just use the little raise your hand thing. Um, and then we will uh, take you and uh, and get going. Anyone who would like to start? Otherwise, I have to search through the. All right, here we go. Hendrik Rood says, "Question to Marit: As a user of KPN, I can receive Netflix if I switch to T-Mobile or Vodafone Sego. I can receive Netflix. My monthly subscription fee to Netflix doesn't change, but Netflix, who I am paying a monthly subscription." who can choose between KPN, Vodafone, or T-Mobile to reach me. So when Vodafone would double their fair share uh, gigabyte per month uh, fine fee, should Netflix then charge me a higher monthly subscription fee to signal to me which of the access networks is the more volume fee expensive one, if you understand that question? Um... To be honest, I'm not sure I do, but I, I do understand it's a question about about prices, I guess. Um, listen, I mean, everybody's facing upwards kind of going pricing pressures. I mean, our sector is facing it. Uh, I believe the content providers are facing it. Um, I think Netflix already in the last six months uh, raised their prices quite a lot. Um, telco prices are also going up uh, in, in places. It's, it's an ecosystem. And I think that there are costs and somebody has to cover the costs. Um, and it is again for policymakers to, to decide effectively what is more important, universal connectivity or content, entertainment content that is very cool, very nice. We all love it, um, but, but that's just it. And I don't think that this is a decision that necessarily we will take, but, but certainly, certainly this is a question of costs. Mm -hmm. No, that's but not the question. The question was if uh, if I would I as a consumer can choose between a number of access networks. Uh, the content from my uh, Netflix subscriber can't choose because if I move to another uh, provider, uh, they have to send their traffic to that provider. Now, if one of the uh, providers, because I assume there is not a a joint negotiation with the content industry. So if Vodafone Zero uh, raises their fair share fee to a content on an access provider, should then my subscription per month, which is now uh, eight euros for Netflix, go to 10. And so I can see as a consumer that I could better stick with KPN because they don't charge that high fee Okay. Netflix. Listen, I don't I don't think that we've discussed this in such detail, but I don't see this playing out like that. If there should be something, I see this as an EU level policy whereby somewhere along the lines, the traffic volumes and the different determinants and, and what have you would be averaged out at, at an EU level. And I can't talk on behalf of Netflix, but would be very strange if they would be you know, charging different prices per different operator. I, I don't see that that would be the way it goes, but maybe I didn't understand your question correctly, but. No, this, this is already very helpful because you effectively are planning for a, a more or less uniform sets of fees then. So it will not be no. uh, one uh, one uh, one ex access network negotiating with a, a, a content. Yes, provider. it will be. It will be. It will be. But well, we don't know. I mean, we we know nothing at this stage. We don't have a policy initiative. We have nothing. But in our conceptualization, we are seeing that the most 
the lightest way to do this would be based on existing commercial negotiations. So yes, you have a point. It would be company, you know, facing company negotiation. But then how the costs, because this would be then assumably happening with, with many companies. So how companies then will average out the costs on the side of uh, content providers or investment on, on the side of telcos. I mean, that I, you know, this is not something that we have uh, assessed at all. So yeah, but then, then, then the question will comes completely different. In the Netherlands, all regulation has been dismissed Andrew, in 2020. Stop. The regulator completely, uh, uh, the, the, the courts have skipped all regulation on fixed networks because there was enough competition. And in the Netherlands, we see the most expensive Sounds areas, good. the most expensive areas, uh, the rural ones, are effectively uh, constructed now with FTTH by new entrants. None of the large incumbents invest there. Okay. This has been very helpful back and forth. I'd like to get some other questions in. Thank you very much, Hendrik. Uh, George Sadowski asked a question in the chat. If European users want the content, shouldn't they be willing to pay for the infrastructure to deliver it? If EU telecom price regulations won't let the price rise to that level, then aren't those policies the root of the problem? Rudolf. Um, first of all, EU price regulations are only there for dominant networks. So the Netherlands doesn't have price regulations. You can build a network here. We have competitive networks. KPN isn't regulated either. There are places where networks are regulated, but that's because the operator has market dominance. The way the regulation works is that you're allowed to make a very fair return. Uh, look at the, each EU telco, they are very profitable. When there's competition, they don't have to have a wholesale offer. Um, so EU telcos are doing fine. Some of them are even saying that they want to do wholesale because having more customers on a new built FTTH network actually makes it more profitable. So there's absolutely no reason to assume that the networks aren't being paid for. And there's also no reason to assume that traffic somehow influences costs. Um, really, we talk about six megabits at most per customer. If you can't handle that, there's no telco in the EU that in its investor presentation says, oh, traffic growth, that's causing this amount of cost energy. They all mentioned how much energy costs and how much it raised their cost base. Traffic, no, nowhere. So this is really weird to say that uh, uh, traffic and costs are related. But if I may just add very quickly, I mean, we are not looking at this, this as the situation today. This has been the situation for some time. We are really projecting to the future. But very happy I that am... the commission has launched a consultation that looks at the future of the telecom sector on a broad basis. We but are not fully a... happy with the EU regulation as it is today, but we do see that this pillar of fair contribution is a worthy discussion to have as we are now but... reassessing the future of the telecommunication sector. But, at, at, but Etno hasn't provided any data on how much extra investment is needed because mo most countries will be ready by 2030. The 45 million Etno is mentioning are in a few specific countries. The countries that are done in 2030 are most of Western Europe, most of the former Eastern Europe countries, Bulgaria, Greece, Germany, and Belgium are behind. So why are we changing the entire situation for basically, oh yeah, and Italy it, it is to be mentioned as well. Why are we having this entire debate about traffic if the problem is a lack of investment by some countries? Why aren't we then talking about how to get fiber to some developing nations? 
I think I said Rudolf in the beginning, it's about coverage and cap uh, capacity, but I don't want to go to bore the international crowd with the European yeah. specific spy country. Yeah. Right. Speaking of developing countries, I have a question here in the chat. Seems like people want to ask questions in the chat rather than raise their hand. So uh, I have a question from Henriette Esterhuizen in South Africa. She asks, if as some of the panelists are saying, there's enough investment already from the platforms in infrastructure peering and the telcos have enough money to do as well with costs coming down, then why are so many parts of the world still without sufficient infrastructure? From my end of the planet, this is a clear market failure and there is public sector failure. I am at, not asking that Etno's proposals are necessarily the answer, but there's a problem. How does this debate translate to other parts of the world? So, Michael. So it's an excellent question. I'm not sure it's a market failure per se, although I can see why it feels like one. Um, I mean, it's a it's a question of costs and affordability, um, and and getting the financing to reach the areas that that are expensive to reach or that are sparsely populated. Um, and um, you know, I'm not going to d defend necessarily the the caps, but they are spending a fair amount of money on on um, building IXPs into most countries to lower the cost of traffic exchange, helping some in Uganda. They're helping develop, you know, build some fiber to help with connections for the mobile operators. Um, but I think it's a broader problem than that. And um, the ITU now certainly under Doreen is has a partner to connect that's that's getting significant pledges. Uh, you mentioned the public sector issues. Uh, some countries are sitting on all of their universal service fund money. So it's clearly a problem. It's clearly um, needing all of those things. And some of it is regulation, um, licensing more operators will help uh, making it easier to land capacity and and build it into the country uh, so there's a lot of issues i'm not sure it's a market failure but it clearly needs to be addressed and it clearly shouldn't be minimized and and i see that you do say that th this shouldn't be part of it that was in 2012 and i think that was pretty roundly rejected that uh the the any proposal on uh, sending party pays Play a part of it, but clearly it's a it's a significant issue. Right. Okay. I, I see. Uh, actually, uh, Desiree Milosevic has her hand up. But Rudolph, just quickly, two fingers on this one, and then let me go yeah. bring in um, an uh, audience member. We can also look at how this played out for telephony. We all we, now the debate is about internet traffic, but for the OECD, I did a study on interconnection rates. And what we saw in India was an excellent example. India dropped its rates for mobile and fixed telephony to some of the lowest rates in the world. And as a result, the build out of networks, both nationally and to the rest of the world, was actually stimulated. It gave India its um, call center industry and all kinds of other things happening there. Pakistan did the exact opposite and raised the rates and actually saw less investment, less build out. Um, interconnection rates have never stimulated rollout. They've had the exact opposite every time and again. And um, when you have investment problems, there's often national situations. And yes, sometimes. Uh, aid from Western countries should be an option. If we need to ha help Africa, let's put a fund together. But um, what we saw in recent years is actually 10 cables, I think, built to various parts of Africa now. There's so much capacity to Africa that the big question is now, how do we build it in the countries? Not how do we get it out? How do we get it distributed? And that's less to do with the rest of the world and more to do with local situations. Okay, great. Uh, Desiree Milosevic, uh, nice to see you. Um, I don't know if you're in the UK, Serbia, somewhere else, but anyway, please ask a question. Thank you, Bill. I just landed. Um, hello from Berlin. Um, I was in New York last night. Um, but anyhow, uh, just um, to uh, ask further the question, uh, what are we talking about here is some unclosed amount 
that needs to be negotiated. Um, I just like to say that the cooperation working group at RIPE uh, also is looking at, at this problem. So we're having parallel discussions and I'm enjoying this panel. Um, my question is really um, to Etno, what, um, do they then uh, see that there will be um, some kind of universal service obligation on telcos to provide gigabit broadband to all rural places in Europe? Or how do you see this money being spent that is potentially negotiated? Shall I just take it, Bill? Thank you, Desiree. Really nice sure. to hear from you. Um, listen, I mean, we, we in some countries in Europe, there is already a universal service obligation. Sometimes this is imposed by a spectrum auction. So in many countries like, uh, I don't know, Germany, France, when you get a license, a spectrum uh, license, you have an obligation, a universal serv service obligation to, to use that license to then deploy in a certain amount of percentage of, of the country. It depends a little bit on the country how much that is. Other countries have even, I believe, universal service funds. And I've heard that, for example, in Bulgaria, there would be such a fund. but. From our experience, and we've done a little bit of looking into it, they haven't typically worked very well. Um, and for, from where we are sitting, actually, this new digital decade targets, the European Union kind of political goal, if you like, so 5G and FTTH to everybody, well, not FTTH, very high capacity networks, which could be other technologies too, um, by 2030, that is you know, it's not the universal service obligation, but in a way it is the political pledge that that's where we are going. And we certainly as operators, I mean, well, our members have been fully endorsing this approach. So so I don't see that at the moment we have really, um, well, yeah, we don't have an EU wide approach, but in some countries, certainly you have this in place using different means. Okay, uh, I see that we, unless people need to jump on that one, I, we have another question from, yes, okay. Uh, from Philippa Biggs at the International Telecommunication Union in Switzerland. Hi, Philippa. Uh, please ask a question. Hi. Hello, everybody. Thank you for a very interesting discussion, uh, which covered a lot of ground, uh, obviously, with uh, a specific uh, European angle. <laughs> I, I'm asking this in a personal capacity. Um, where on earth is the discussion of climate change because uh, having spent three months last summer at 40 degrees or 38 maybe <laughs> depending on where you were um, I'm not you know this is really uh, an issue and I would have more confidence in the um, uh, accuracy of discussions honestly we, we need to be pricing in here um, the public you're talking about public good well let's talk about public damage um, there are significant carbon emissions, way more than I, <laughs> I think are known or understood, plus the heat pollution from uh, servers and data centers. Uh, companies, private companies like Facebook, Google, Amazon, they're all putting their data centers in the North, uh, the Scandinavia and Arctic Circle. I'm not surprised <laughs> the ice melt is going faster than ever. I don't believe the climatologists have factored that into their models. So um, whilst we're talking about interconnection and, and um, charging, then you know, it would be very important uh, to get the climate uh, angle in there and how we can possibly compensate for the, you know, some form of carbon offset in a sensible way. Okay. Um, so, thanks. Great, thanks, Felipe. That's an interesting spin on it. Uh, Rudolph, you have a you have a thought on that? Yes, um, I've actually done quite a bit of study also for the Dutch uh, governments around Amsterdam with regards to data centers, but also wider. Um, it's a widespread misconception that data traffic and energy use are correlated. There's a lot of academic research that cites kilowatt hour per gigabyte measures, which are completely wrong. Um, gigawatt, uh, a kilowatt hour per gigabyte is like 
measuring the energy use of lampposts by the number of cars that drive by. It's about this relevant. Um, the reality is that according to research by Ericsson, but also data from Etno, uh, data from almost every incumbent telco in Europe, uh, traffic has gone up massively and energy use has either stayed stable or decreased. Case of the KPN in the Netherlands, for example, 24 times increase in traffic, and they still use, and they now use only 60% of what they used before. Um, particularly when we move to fiber and 5G, we will save even more energy. Of course, if we build more 5G sites in countries that haven't had connectivity yet, we will see some more use. But um, a recent st study by ASEP in, uh, and ADEME in France showed that they expect until 2050 stable energy use for the networks. There's debate about some other the other stuff going around with data centers. Data center, modern data centers do replace inefficient older uh, computer centers from firms, et cetera, server rooms. So that's where the debate now is like, how will that develop? But the French government last month said, well, we don't expect until 2050 networks to basically change their use in terrible else. Okay, thanks. We have time for one more question, then we're gonna wrap up. Uh, we haven't heard from an American yet, but we have uh, a question from Jonathan McHale, who is a long time uh, person at the lead person on telecom at the office of the US Trade Representative, who's now with CCIA, the Industry Association. Uh, Jonathan, you wanna go ahead? Sure, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, question for Etno. Um, if you are proposing to institute a um, arbitration model, what would be the basis on which you would assign costs? Are you proposing to put in a cost model, which of course we spent, 20 years uh, not too successfully doing it in telephony. And the second question is, if you figure out a way to assign costs to one set of market participants, uh, aren't you essentially subsidizing the smaller uh, content suppliers uh, through payments that the, the larger would make? And how is that consistent with you know, traditional concepts of non-discrimination and possibly net neutrality? Thank you. Good question. Uh, Marit, you want to take it? Yeah, I can I can try. Um, to be quite honest, I mean, the, the, the costings, I mean, you know, we in Europe, just to make it clear, we are still debating also the problem statement. We're trying to frame the, the, the issue from our side as well. So to start discussing, uh, you know, regulatory or policy specifics, uh, including some kind of pricing mechanisms, uh, is, is, is way out there for us at the moment. So this is something that policymakers obviously would have to look at and uh, make sure that then, as you say, that uh, it will be, there will be no major distortions to the market. Um, we do of course have to always say that as we already discussed the, about the open internet regulation, for example, that any policy or regulation typically does have some economic consequences on one or the other side. Somebody benefits, somebody loses. So those are those key policy decisions I think that our policymakers in Europe will have to make. Okay. Um, thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Marit, for that response. Uh, it's getting to be 1227, so I think we need to wrap this up. This has been, I think, a very interesting and productive discussion. Uh, I've participated in a number of other calls on these where the discussion tended to be slanted one direction or the other pretty strongly. Uh, this one, I think, was relatively balanced. So. Hopefully we heard a good exchange of views from very diverse uh, viewpoints. Obviously, as I say, the European Commission is running its consultation now. Anybody who has open consultation, anybody who has views that they want to share with the EU really should participate in that. They need to hear from a more diverse set of, of players. So, all right, I'm going to wrap up and say thank you. And again, remind you that the the next uh, webinar will be uh, on Tuesday, the 18th uh, in April. And now let me turn back for closing thought to uh, Ellie Nome. Ellie, go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Bill. Uh, this was a really interesting discussion. And uh, I, uh, having participated in uh, discussions and having written books on the subject, uh, 
telecom in Europe many decades ago, television in Europe uh, decades ago, uh, books on interconnection uh, networks, etc. There were lots of themes here that were recurrent. So looking at, in some ways, at the broad history here, at the trend, uh, there was a time, uh, in a sees this as a discussion between over economic rents, basically, between large users and infrastructure providers. There was a time, the PTT model, uh, where uh, the, the uh, um, infrastructure providers were uh, riding high in the saddle and they were dominant um, and users were not. Uh, that changed somewhere in the mid 80s uh, to the end of the century, perhaps, uh, where large users were able to persuade uh, the public to uh, open up the system. And so therefore the large users actually had a kind of uh, increasingly uh, better deal than they had before. Now the question is, is the pendulum swinging back? The difference in each of these stages has been, uh, in my mind, is where did government end up being? Whose ally was it? During the PTT period, it clearly was on the side of the infrastructure providers for a variety of reasons. But then came the change uh, in the 80s and 90s uh, to liberalization and opening and privatization. And the uh, large users had persuaded the governments about innovation and competi competitiveness and efficiency, et cetera. So the question now is who is more persuasive to bring the government on their side? To my mind, uh, in listening to this discussion here and looking at the dynamics, uh, it seems pretty clear that the European governments uh, and therefore uh, the European Union are sooner or later going to go the direction of the infrastructure providers, uh, particularly once you identify the large users as American or Chinese large uh, and somehow kind of insulate European uh, large users or medium sized users from that. Uh, Levy. And so that's, I think, what's going to happen. And so the question now is moving forward is what are some of the issues uh, to think about for policy analysts? Uh, one of them is how do we deal with the inevitable incentives to vertical integration that the system uh, will provide? Another one is how do we deal with uniformity within Europe versus diversity within Europe on these rules? Uh, the third third reason, and that's probably a political one, is how do we deal with the erosion or the reduction in consumer surplus that this new system will inevitably incur, meaning consumers will have to pay more. And lastly, the question is that kind of was just addressed at the very end by Jonathan, which is what is the pricing model exactly that would underlie governmental interventions arbitration, whatever it is, we cannot just wave our hands here and say, well, we'll work something out. Is it average pricing? Is it marginal pricing? Is it efficient component pricing? Is it Ramsey pricing? Uh, and is, are there some added levies? We talked at the, at the end about, uh, uh, one of the comments was about uh, uh, the environmental impact. So would there be some kind of extra charge for kind of environmental defense uh, and protection fund or something along these lines, uh, what exactly is this uh, system going to look like? I think there's some very fruitful um, uh, role for economists now to play, uh, to try to figure out exactly what kind of pricing there will be. Because it seems to me based on the discussion here and on the dynamics of uh, European and EU that some charges will be levied sooner or later. And I'm not saying this as an endorsement, uh, just as purely as an observation. And so I'd like to thank everybody, uh, and in particular Bill, who's moderated and organized the session and asked the uh, very pertinent and good questions, and to you, the panelists. Uh, see you hopefully uh, uh, back a month from now. Thank you. Okay, thanks everybody. And particularly the panelists, thank you very much for being here. Yeah, bye. Interesting session as always. <laughs>